because I want to hit the record button on this, which I've just done because I want to record this for training purposes. All right, back into it. All right, so thank you again for joining our Creating a Business Case for Resilience. So one of the biggest challenges that uh, I've noticed in working with uh, HR teams and people um, in general is that if they want to bring resilience as a concept into their organizations, um, they need to see the business case for it. So today we're gonna to be going through the business case and uh, hopefully that's gonna be uh, in, a, in a situation where it's gonna make a lot of sense to you and something that you can clearly uh, take back and share with others. So at the end of this, uh, at the end of this presentation, I will be forwarding each of you um, a copy of the business case so that you can share. So who is Dave Bozanko? Uh, really quickly, who am I? I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a speaker, I'm an Ironman triathlete, and I'm a leader who genuinely cares. And if you can see the picture in front of you right now, just a little quick story. Um, about six years ago, I decided that uh, as a business person, I had a lot of, of information to share and give back to kids. And I actually went out and uh, bought 30 uh, spin bikes and a trailer, and I got a contract with my local school board, uh, and I went out and I did these classes with high school kids, four classes a day. I would literally wheel out 30 spin bikes into a high school, do four classes, and wheel them back into my trailer. And I did this for about two months. And this picture really means a lot to me because when I see the looks on those kids' faces looking at me, you realize that you have an opportunity to not only um, inspire young kids, but also to change the course of their lives. So who am I? I'm someone who genuinely cares, and I really love working with parents and kids. Um, that's just sort of my wheelhouse. But uh, that doesn't mean that everybody can't benefit from what I'm talking about, but just this is who I am, and I'm a pretty, pretty straight shooter about these things. Today, what I'm going to be sharing with you is a business case, and uh, the overall um, emphasis on the case will be uh, in this executive summary, company goals, the problem, the opportunity, will change solve the problem, who's going to benefit from this, uh, what are the consequences of inaction, and what's the proposed solution that I'm presenting today. So what I want to talk about in business is that, you know, every business has the same goals, which is to sell more goods and services effectively, efficiently, and profitably. That is the, uh, that's what's going to get the attention of every uh, C-suite executive when you're sitting down and trying to make a business case to them. You need to be able to talk about how the changes you're proposing can be effective, efficient, and create more profitability for the company. So with that in mind and meeting business owners where they are or business executives where they are, first we have to frame the problem. And stress-induced employee burnout is one of the greatest problems that we're currently facing. There was some research done um, before COVID-19 that said that two-thirds of full-time workers are dealing with burnout at work and you know, add the crises that we're currently facing with not only COVID but uh, civil unrest in North America. Um, you know, that, that number has only increased. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, at the age of 40, I was dealing with burnout, which led to a heart scare and a heart crisis, which caused me to go on this journey for the last 13 years of finding out what resilience really is and what it means to me and how I can share that with other people. So we recognize that resilience is a key problem. Every business is experiencing this. And if you look at every HR blog out there right now, everybody's talking about having to get serious about well-being. Well-being is top of mind for all employees. This new normal, whatever it ends up being, um, well-being has to be front and center. We can't just pay at lip service anymore. So along with every problem, there's an opportunity. And success leaves clues. I've always been a believer in that. And in this case, success leaves clues for developing physical, mental, and personal resilience. So if you think about it, whether you're a successful business person, whether you're an athlete, an entertainer, the very, very most successful people are the ones who have overcome, res or overcome crisis, overcome adversity, they've been resilient at what they've done, and they've found a way to not only survive, but thrive. And that's what makes you know, the world's best athletes, the world's best entertainers, and the world's most successful business people. They've learned how to thrive, but they've also left clues. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today, some of those clues. Now, will resilience actually solve the problem? Um, Harvard researchers uh, did some reports. Sean Acor, who's a Harvard researcher, wrote the book, The Happiness Advantage, uh, did a study back in 2012. 
And what he found was that happy, healthy, resilient employees do affect the bottom line. Uh, and the numbers are pretty telling. Uh, those people who come to work who are more resilient are 37% more successful in their careers. They're three times more as creative. Um, they did a study with doctors and found out that their diagnoses um, for those doctors who were feeling more healthy, happy, and resilient were 19% more accurate, which is like an amazing statistic, especially in the medical field. Um, you know, 23% had fewer fatigue problems, which has simply meant absenteeism in your organization went down because people didn't feel stressed out and the need to take those absentee days. Um, I love the idea that healthy, happy, resilient people are 10 times more engaged in their job. And I'm going to show you why that is in a moment. And then 31% more productive. You know, if I'm thinking about as a business owner wanting to have a more productive uh, 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 employee base, having to be engaged and happy and healthy, that's, that's an employer's dream. So we're going to try and make that dream come true with, uh, some, pres well, with, with, with some uh, resilience tactics today. So when I talk about who the main benefactors are, what I found really is that um, senior managers tend to be set in their ways. And even though they can change, they're a little more reluctant to change. And some of the executives that I've coached have told me that after they've gone through this training, while they thought this was a really good supplement for you know, individual coaching for executives, they thought that en masse in larger groups, those early career development or those mid managers who are open to change would be the best audience for this message because, you know, if they're open to change in their earlier in their career, you know, it's better to um, move from changing a mindset to training a mindset. And I often think about, um, you know, this is from an athletic standpoint is that, you know, it's, it's better, it's easier to train your mind early on to develop good habits than it is to try to change bad habits later on. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, what are some of the consequences of inaction? You know, in every business case, you've got to have sort of set up or frame what would happen if things remain status quo. Well, if you look at companies like Blockbuster, Kodak, Yellow Pages, Nokia, these were big Fortune 500 companies in their day, and they refused to adapt. They refused to uh, be agile enough to change with the future. And you know, the, the, the logo says it all, remember us, you know, they, they fell by the wayside. Um, so what we want to try to do is, is give a plan to, or a, a strategies for companies so that they don't become another statistic. We want companies to survive. We want people to thrive. So the proposed solution that I'm going to get into in a minute here is off the shelf resilience training. Now I know that a lot of companies um, utilize programs like LinkedIn Learning, or uh, they have their own corporate training that they do. But after talking to and sharing this program with a number of HR managers from Fortune 500 companies, what I've learned is that we've hit on a, a marketplace here or a segment of the marketplace that isn't being served. There's lots of leadership courses out there. There's lots of courses for people who want to be well, but there's very few that can package it all together and, and, and make sense out of it, give people a different perspective so that they can see their way moving forward. So what I'm going to try to do today is share with you my thought process for this off the shelf training, which simply means that you can buy it off the shelf, it's very inexpensive, um, or you know, if you're a, uh, a large company, um, there's other options for customizing this type of training. But anybody, can benefit from this and that's the that's the beauty of this um, right now what i'd like to do is ask you this question and you can just uh, chime in in the chat or, or you can say it out loud you know when you think about resilience what are some of the words that you would use that come to mind to help you think about resilience what, what words come to mind uh, christina jacqueline survivor survivor good anything else um, well, you've said words like being agile, adaptability, uh, willingness to change, not be entrenched in old ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Christina, you're on mute, but do you have any suggestions at all that you might want to share as well? Yes, I would say strength, development, and power in my case, or this is how I perceive it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Those are all great words. And I think one of the things that I wanted to share with everybody is that 
when I talk to people about resilience, one of the things I always hear is that people try to, to sort of package it up in this little tidy box and say resilience is this thing. It's grit. It's determination. Um, and it's not that at all. That's just one cog in the wheel. So let me jump back into the presentation here and I'll, I'll keep moving forward. Uh, share my screen again. Here we go. So when I talk about resilience, I want you to think about resilience as being like this big jigsaw puzzle. And I've got this really fun animation to, to make a point here. But the idea is that there are three legs to resilience in my mind, personal resilience, mental resilience, and physical resilience. And in those three legs of that tripod, there are so many little pieces. And all those little pieces have to add up together in order for somebody to be resilient in their life. If you're only really good at one or two or three of those pieces, the puzzle isn't complete. And I've seen it both personally and professionally where people get really good at one area and they let the other areas of their life fall to the wayside. And that's when problems start to occur. And that's when people become less resilient because problems get in the way of that ability to adapt and thrive and survive. So what I would like to do is, oops, I want to get out of this. There we go. So I want to talk about these three legs of resilience, physical, mental, and personal resilience. And I'm going to go over those, into those in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a marketing uh, term that we learned many years ago, or I learned many years ago back in college. And what's really interesting is as I think about the science behind building resilience, it fits neatly into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because when you think about the basic needs, I, I often say to people, you know, if you stop breathing, if your heart stops beating, you're dead. And I hate to be as blunt as that, but when I had my heart crisis at 40, that's exactly what the doctor said to me. You've got two choices. Either go on medication for the rest of your life or lose some weight and get in shape. Choice is yours. Either way, you know, you're either going to do good things for yourself and you're going to survive, or you're going to do bad things and you're not going to survive. So physical resilience for me is always the foundation. People are healthier and happier when they feel well. So, you know, we were talking earlier about people going for walks. You know, that's awesome that you, and I think one of the nicest things about this current crisis that we're in is I'm seeing a lot more people out walking, which is terrific. People are channeling their energy into more positive things. But when you think about our physical needs, um, physical on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it sits down at the bottom. Then you get into sort of mental resilience, which is that safety and love and belonging, self-esteem. And then you get into personal growth, which is self-actualization. That's when you learn, you've learned enough, you can start sharing things. You've developed the sense of curiosity that you want to learn along with other people. Uh, this is really how I think of the tripod and the three legs of resilience. So let's dive into this just a little bit more deeply. The biggest thing that I found is that we've got to meet uh, people wherever they're stuck. And I'm hoping that you can see this and Elon Musk's face isn't, uh, isn't blocked out by our, our um, uh, screens. But if you can see this, I, I often think of Elon Musk because, you know, he just had a successful launch, uh, putting a couple of uh, astronauts onto the space station the other day. And Elon Musk, in his head, he is stuck trying to get um, people living on Mars. And while that's a really wonderful vision for Elon and it's a really wonderful goal for him, it's not one that I can really get behind. You know, I can get behind maybe driving an electric car, maybe driving a Tesla one day. That seems to be within my wheelhouse. But I'm not going to be stuck where Elon gets stuck or his team gets stuck thinking of these grandiose visions. So you've got to sort of meet people where they're stuck. And in my case, I've been stuck three times. Um, and I'm going to share a couple of quick little analogies or stories with you of, of where I've been stuck. And maybe you can relate to this. Uh, hopefully you can. But over my 30-year business career, I used to, do, I used to um, work with some of Canada's largest retailers. And I had a clothing line called Hockey Mom and Hockey Dad that we sold um, at major retailers across the country. And in 2008, one of my buyers that I had inherited, I inherited a new buyer at, at one of my customers, not Walmart. Um, they basically uh, inherited a large purchase order and um, the, the, the financial crash of 2008 was about to happen. And he decided he didn't want any private label brands in his stores across the country. So rather than be honest with me and tell me what his intentions were, he didn't tell me and he said you just wait the orders will come and I got stuck as an entrepreneur because I did not want to pay the consequences of not meeting an order I had to suffer the consequences of building all that inventory bringing it into the country 
and then sitting on it and almost going financially bankrupt. A lot of business owners, when they think that they're doing business and they think that things are successful and they're working with big organizations, you get, get stuck by their ego. And their ego starts to say, I, I, you know, I've got to keep doing it this way. Otherwise, I could get in trouble. I could lose everything that I've built up for. In doing that, I allowed my business not only to almost come to financial ruin, but I also allowed my personal health to become financially or, or physically unstable because I wasn't paying attention to my diet or exercise. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, about burning the candle at both ends and, and not making time to get out and actually physically move throughout the day. Um, so I was doing these things and that led to a health crisis at 40. I was 50 pounds overweight. I was suffering chronic heart disease and I had to make some changes. Fortunately, I was able to find uh, the sport of triathlon or endurance sport running to start with actually. And a, a long story short, I ran into an Ironman triathlete one day um, he taught me a lot about in five minutes about my belief system having to change. And that opportunity led to a string of opportunities to one day I found myself crossing an Ironman finish line and then doing it two more times. So even in that process of becoming an endurance athlete, I got stuck in my own head thinking that I was trying to get on the podium. I was trying to be super competitive like I was when I was younger. And in reality, what I wanted was to have a healthy heart and a healthy mind when I was 60, 70, 80, and 90 years old. But I was falling back on what I had learned in high school when it came to sports and my attitude towards competition. And I was actually training in a way that may have been serving my ego, but it wasn't really serving my, my long-term um, better health, which is really what I was trying to focus on. So my point here is that in business, in your personal life, even in your, your fun things that you do for entertainment or to, to amuse yourself, we can get stuck all over the place. And, and my job as a coach is to help people see where they're getting stuck. And this is really where I think a lot of my clients, um, a lot of my clients uh, have issues. So let me just stop here and ask, has anybody ever felt stuck before? Um, just a yes or a no. Have you ever felt stuck at any part of your life in any situation? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yes. Awesome. And so like, it's not abnormal. It's, it's, it happens all the time. And what's, what's actually kind of unique is even though, you know, I, I call myself a resilience expert, but I like the term resilience enthusiast because expert implies that you know everything. Enthusiast implies that you're willing to learn. So I like to say I'm a, a resilience enthusiast because I know that there are times when I'm going to get stuck and I'm not going to see it. And all of a sudden I'm going to recognize it and go, boy, am I, am I ever glad I had a system to help me see this stuff so that I don't continue to make the same mistakes moving forward. All right. So one of my favorite mentors in business is uh, Satya Nadella. He's the CEO of Microsoft. And he sums up what I just said very perfectly. He says, we don't want to be a know-it-all. We want to be a learn-it-all. And when we get older in our lives, say 45, 50, 60, and you've had you know, 20, 30 years of experience under your belt, you seem to think, or you, you get this mindset where you think you know everything. And we have to have humility. We have to have the ability to take risks and to risk failing to learn so that we can keep improving in our lives. So I just wanted to share this one slide because I think it's important to share that even the, the largest companies in the world are all saying the same things, that we have to shift in this mind. We have to shift our mindset from know-it-all to learn-it-all. Be lifelong learners. Now, I've got a process that, that ironically is a nice acronym, VIP. Uh, and it helps people get unstuck in life. So what we do is we talk about vision. This is where when I, when I coach people, they go through my training and I coach people, this is where people always get hung up because not everybody's a visionary. Not everybody's a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk um, or Richard Branson. Um, it's difficult for a lot of people to actually visualize what their life's going to look like when they're 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. So, you know, if you can't visualize that, then you struggle with this idea of, you know, I'm just going to take care of the moment and I'm not going to worry about a year from now or 10 years from now, that'll take care of itself. And when you do that, you fall into a little bit of a trap. So the idea here is that, you know, not everybody has to be a great visionary, but you'll learn that every resilient, successful person has had a vision they can align themselves to. There's a really important distinction there. I think Martin Luther King, based on what's going on right now, a lot of people align themselves to the vision that one day there would be racial equality in North America. And there's a lot of people who still believe that's possible. 
So they've aligned themselves to that vision. They can see that in their mind's eye. Whereas, you know, not everybody was that great visionary, but they've bought into that vision. So, you know, not everybody was like Steve Jobs who created these amazing tools for us to make our lives easier. But boy, we all bought into the vision that these are really useful tools and I, I like where this is taking me. I'm going to invest some time and energy in trying to use these tools to make my life better. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense when it comes to thinking about vision. Vision is something that you can clearly see in your mind's eye. I have this vision where I believe that if I do my job correctly and if I apply my time and energy correctly, that every parent will have the opportunity to sit down at the kitchen table and have informed and intelligent conversations about diet, exercise, and mental health with their kids. I think if we all do that, then we, all, we'll, we will raise a generation the next generation of leaders. We'll be better communicators, we'll be more open-minded. I mean, I grew up with parents, and most people of my generation did, who when you asked their dad a question, if he didn't know the answer, he made it up because he never wanted to look like he didn't have the right answer. And today, I'm not afraid to say, I don't know, let's figure it out together. Let's spark some curiosity in our kids. And I've been doing this for 13 years. 13 years. My kids are 22 and 25 now, and I have amazing conversations with them. They say, you know what? The, the nicest thing is that we have such a good dialogue between each other. That it's one that our, their friends simply don't have with their parents because they, their parents never sat down to have these kind of conversations. They were too busy trying to be successful at work or there were subjects that were taboo. And I'm like, no, let's talk about it. Because if this is going to be a mental health issue for you down the road, let's talk about it now. Finances, let's talk about it. There's no reason why we shouldn't be talking about the sensitive subjects that cause the most stress in our lives. So that's, that's my vision is that we're going to sit down as parents are on the kitchen table and talk with our kids better. I can see that in my mind's eye. And I know people who've aligned themselves to my vision sort of feel the same way. I've also got this vision that I'll be able to enjoy youthful activities for the rest of my life. So that's another part of my vision that people can sort of relate to. Now, let me ask this question. Are you, can you articulate, are you aligned with any visions? Is there something that you could articulate and say, Hey, this is my vision for the future. Um, my vision is more about creating learning cultures and organizations. Mm -hmm. Can you can you describe that for me so that I can see it in my mind's eye? Um, we've done we do away with performance management. And managers are more coaching and people continuous learning and promoting it. It's mm -hmm. learning on the job. People feel like they can learn. People are allowed to be innovative. We get a, get rid of the command and control organization. Mm -hmm. So within that, I can, I can start to visualize what you're talking about. I can see coaches versus managers. I can see group learning versus independent learning. You know, I, I can start to visualize what you're saying. So one of the, the neat things about having a, a really clear vision statement is, is once you've got that in your head, now you've got direction. And that's, a, I mean, you might have, you know, you might be able to articulate that really clearly because it's something that you've been thinking about. But the challenge for a lot of people is that they don't think in terms of vision. They just think of what's the next thing that I've got to deal with. And they never step back to see the bigger picture. So you are almost, Jacqueline, an anomaly that you actually were pretty clear about what you were thinking about here. So that's actually excellent. Um, but most people you'll find will really struggle with a vision because they have a tough time putting into words where they want to see themselves in their future. And that's what being resilient is all about. It's about constantly learning. It's about constantly improving. Now, let me bring this another uh, step forward. Um, uh, Simon Sinek uh, just wrote a new book called um, uh, Finite Versus Infinite Thinking. And it really resonated with me because when he talks about finite and infinite thinking, well, if you look at a roadmap, right, like you're in Mississauga, um, and, and, and I know um, this is a map of Ontario, uh, so, <laughs> but it, right there is Gravenhurst in the middle. And if you think about it, if you don't have a vision as to where you're going, you're going to get in the car, you're going to drive wherever you, will, you know, want to go to, but eventually you're going to run out of the resources and the funds and the means and the desire to keep going. But if you know, hey, I'm trying to get to Gravenhurst, um, I, it may, I may take 15 different roads to get there, eventually I'm going to get there because I know where I'm going. That's sort of the roadmap, the vision, the purpose of a vision is to give us that sort of clarity as to where we're going. And then that's gonna give us the clarity to step back and say, hey, I know Gravenhurst is north, but I'm traveling south. I'm making a mistake here. That's where you sort of have to get uh, into your own mind and go, oh, 
we've got uh, somebody who wants to join us here. Uh, hi, Tara. We've just uh, we've already got into the process here, but uh, glad to have you on board. And uh, we're sort of halfway through the presentation, but I'll be happy to share with you after we're done. So yeah, we're talking about finite versus infinite thinking. And what you'll find is that the more clear you are on where you're going, the more you can focus your energy and resources towards that end outcome. Now, I talked about vision. Now let's talk about identity. So when I talk about identity in the VIP process, right, the way that you create and realize that vision is by assuming the identity of the type of person who would live in that world every day. And I try to explain to people, it's, it's like a recipe. Um, we are all following a recipe. We're creatures of habit. And for the most part, 80% of what we eat every day, 80% of what we do every day is the same thing day in and day out. And wouldn't it really suck to find out that your recipe for success may have been broken and backwards 10 years down the road. And that's what a lot of people are experiencing with physical resilience. A lot of people are starting to experience that with mental resilience because they're going, wait a minute, this isn't what I thought this was supposed to be. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm breaking down here mentally because this just isn't the outcome that I was expecting. And then you've got the third, which is personal growth. And people just say, I don't have time to learn anything new. I'm too busy. But if you have this sense of curiosity, and if you have this sense of purpose and desire and wanting to be somewhere very specific, you will do anything you can to get there. And I'll show you a way in a second on how you can actually take those steps forward every day to get to that place that you absolutely have to be. It's kind of like the Iron Man finish line. You know, there's nothing like it in, 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 the, in this world. It's an experience that money can't buy. And you will do anything you can to get there because you have a very clear vision of what that's going to feel and look like when you get there. And all I'm trying to say is that we're all following recipes. And if you follow the right recipe, you become more resilient every day, day in and day out. And that starts to accumulate. And that starts to help you feel very good about where you are in your life. But here's what happens is the third leg of that, uh, of that tripod, uh, vision, identity, the last one is proof. And if you think about it, if you go to work and you earn an income, you go back to your bank account and go, yep, there's my proof that I was actually, this was worth my time and effort. I've got money in the bank. If you go to the gym, why do people quit gym memberships? It's because when they get on the scale, if the results aren't showing them what, they're, what they wanted to see, they go, this doesn't work. I give up. I quit. In future thinking and looking at long-term goals and bringing them into the present, what you need to have is a resilience playbook. A resilience playbook helps you to manage both the physical, personal, and mental progress that you're making so that you can take that, that future goal and bring it into the present day. This is one of the tricks that I learned as an Ironman triathlete um, about 10 years ago is that when you start journaling and journaling in the right way, you start feeling like you're making progress, even though the goal, the, the finish line, might be a year or two out. So we need to have immediate social proof. And all science for motivation points to having journals and social proof as a way of moving forward. And the biggest challenge I can tell you uh, from doing executive wellness coaching over the last six years as well is that the number one complaint I hear from people is, um, I, 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 I do not want to do this. I lack all motivation. You know, the, the number one complaint, lack of motivation. Hate diet and exercise, have no motivation to get started. Like that is the number one thing. But my wife and my doctor or my husband and my doctor, they're all telling me I got to do this. So this is where people are stuck right now. And, and what I'm trying to help them do with intrinsic motivation is help bring those future goals into the present. So you need to find a way to give them something now to hold on to. And we do that through the process of journaling and creating winning streaks. So, you know, when I was training to become an Ironman, for example, that's a year's worth of specific training to get to the finish line every single day. Now, if I didn't have measurements along the way that told me that I was doing the right thing, that I was making progress, I'd have given up a long time ago. But when you can actually see the progress on paper and you can start to feel the progress in your body, you start to believe that, hey, I can actually do this thing. And that's how you start to not only survive situations, but actually learn how to thrive because you've gone through the adversity and the challenge. So well, the, one of the last things I want to leave you with is, is I, I talk to people all the time 
about the idea of long-term resilience doesn't happen overnight. It's a work in progress. Um, I can tell you that over the last 15 years, what I've learned is that what, you know, I get clearer and clearer on my vision. I get clearer and clearer on my recipe. And as I think I'm getting clearer, what's also happening is I'm getting older. And what worked for me in my 40s maybe isn't going to work for me in my 50s, probably won't work for me in my 60s. So I have to keep tweaking the recipe so that I get the outcome that I was expecting. Um, one of the things that, that I, I talk to people about all the time is mental health and, and Alzheimer's and dementia. I do have um, a history of dementia in my family. And one of the things that I found out through this journey of resilience was learning that I don't want to end up in a nursing home like my father did uh, with dementia and die in there. That's just not going to be my fate. And, and I know it's not going to be my fate because what I learned by getting curious was that only less than 1% of Alzheimer's and dementia cases worldwide are what they call familiar, which means it's in your genetics, you're going to get it. We may have been predisposed to genetics, but it's what we do with our environmental factors, our diet and our exercise, that determines whether or not those genes will get turned on. So there's something really interesting if you have Alzheimer's and dementia in your family, look up the term BDNF, BDNF. I tell this to every group I talk to, if you don't know what it is, start getting curious and asking yourself about it because this is, you need to find ways to get more of this brain matter and regeneration happening in your hippocampus so that you can have a healthy brain uh, long in, in, into your life. Uh, there was a, a great TED talk out there not too long ago and the doctor basically said, um, the idea is the more mass I can put up there, uh, the less chance that disease has of taking over my mind and my body. So. Uh, that's the, the mindset that I currently have is when I think about exercise uh, and training every day for things like Ironman, I don't think about getting on the podium anymore and serving my ego. I think about how can I train to serve my mind and body so that I can you know, be that healthy, happy parent that I want to be and grandparent that I want to be in my 80s and 90s. So uh, with that, I'm going to talk about, uh, and I, I don't know if you're, uh, the uh, windows are blocking on the screen, but I've taken my... Um, my keynote uh, that I do on, on self-motivation and uh, resiliency, and I've put that into a course on Udemy. So if you're not familiar with Udemy, uh, it is an online learning platform. And what I've tried to do is make this available to um, organizations, to people, to individuals, to go through 18 learning modules, 18 very short lectures that are between uh, three to five minutes that make a very specific point about each leg of resilience. And with that, help you build your own resilience playbook so that you can start getting a bigger picture and identifying where things are going right and where things are going wrong and how to be curious to ensure that you not only survive, but you thrive adversity. And the other part, the other part of it is I also offer coaching now online because everything's got to be done virtually. Uh, so I've been coaching people online and I'm happy to do that for those who are interested as well uh, as a supplement to the course. And I'm gonna open it up now to questions. I know I was about seven minutes long, so I apologize for that. Um, but I'd like to open it up for questions right now. I'll leave this uh, note up on the, on the screen. Does anybody have any questions they have for me based on the presentation they saw today? Um, you said like you had a, like a case study. So is the case study basically what you were talking through? The case study is what I was talking, the business case at the beginning is basically what you can take to any business, any executive team and share with them the reasoning for why you would want to do um, okay. resilience training. And then from there, you can customize it to fit the needs of your organization. But like I said in the beginning, every company needs to sell goods and services properly, period. And that's, that's their number one reason for being in existence. And then two, you've got to deal with the fact that your employees are becoming stressed out right now and that there's a very high disproportionate number of people who are disengaged. And so what this training can help them do is not only come to work feeling more energized, it can help them feel more mentally aligned with your organization. And again, I, I mentioned during the presentation that a lot of people get hung up on that vision component. I will tell you this, when your company is clear on its vision and where it's going, and you're clear on your vision and where you wanna go 10 years from now, and you can bring those two together, then you start coming to work every day feeling like you're actually helping move the needle and you're making progress every day. The worst thing that can happen to a younger worker, especially, especially a millennial worker, is they come to work and feel like they're not making a contribution to anything. 
So when I talk to younger employees in their 20s to 30s, the biggest challenge that they're faced with is, I don't feel like I'm making a difference. I don't feel like um, you know, I'm moving the needle for the company. I don't feel like I fit in is what I hear. And then I say to them, well, what's your vision? And they don't have a clear vision because they don't know what they want. So that's when I help them sit down and I, you know, we, we talk about this in the course and we talk about this when I do my coaching. I, I sit down and say, what made you happy in the first place? What, what is it from your past that made, why do you want to get out of bed in the morning? What, what inspires you? And when you can figure out what you're really clear about for your future and, and what inspires you, then you can create a vision for your future and go, yeah, you know, I want to align myself to this company because this is where I see myself fitting in. And then you can start working at that every day because there's nothing worse than a decade going by and you sitting here going, geez, I, I, I thought I was on the right track, but I missed five promotions and, and I don't seem to be making progress and people aren't happy with me and, and I'm getting frustrated. And, and that's what we tend to find at work is we tend to, we tend to find disengaged employees and severely disengaged employees. And the reason is they're not, they're, their vision of where they're going isn't aligned with where the company is going. So that's a really big component of resilience is getting that vision aligned with the companies. Did that make sense, Jacqueline? Makes perfect sense. Okay. So, um, you know, what, are there any other questions I can answer at this time? Um, can you maybe tell us about your experience uh, doing this with other companies? Yeah. So on screen right now, I can share with you, Sarah, Sarah Daly uh, was from a large financial company uh, down in the States. And uh, she went through my training. Now you've got to understand my, this particular training course just got launched two weeks ago and she has gone through the training course. She's gone through actually three weeks ago because she's gone through three weeks of, of, uh, of, of um, coaching along with as a supplement to the training itself. And this is her honest feedback from going through this process. What she found was that she, and, and she's somebody who works in learning and development, who um, really focused on um, new hires and mid-manager leadership training. And she said, where the disconnect is, is we can talk about leadership all day long. We can talk about well-being all day long, but there are no courses out there that put the two together that help people actually create a roadmap or a playbook for themselves to understand how to move forward every day. You can talk about leadership till you're blue in the face, servant leadership. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful concept. But where are your, where's your social proof every day that you're making progress? This is the intrinsic motivation that really drives results. And, you know, as, as I leave this posted up on the screen, um, you can see Sarah's feedback. I mean, this is a senior executive from a large financial company down in the States. And, you know, her, 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 her feedback was wonderful. Um, the idea that we don't even realize that we're stuck half the time that we're just going through our lives, going through the motions, thinking that we're on the right path. You know, there's a great definition for happiness out there. And uh, we used to think, I was at least brought up with the idea that, uh, you know, the early bird gets the worm, uh, you know, work hard, uh, be the hardest worker, success will come. Well, I'll tell you, um, the better definition for, sex, for, for happiness is, happiness should be the joy you feel striving for your full potential every day. If you can wrap your head around that definition, you start to feel like you're making progress every day. If you say, when I'm successful, then I'll be happy, I'll give you a very specific moment in time when I crossed my first Ironman finish line. I had spent maybe seven years of my life getting to that point from being a, a 50 pound overweight couch potato at 40 to crossing my first Ironman finish line. And it wasn't even on the radar for me. And immediately after crossing the finish line, it took me 14 hours. I turned around and I looked up at the clock and I went, hmm, 14 hours, eh? I can do better than that. I didn't allow myself to be happy for even five seconds. I changed the goalposts of what success looked like immediately. So I never allowed myself to experience happiness. And, and immediately I set out a new plan and a new pathway, a new recipe to start serving my ego to get faster. And as I did that, Again, I crossed the finish line and went, wow, that was great. Same amount of time, different recipe, two and a half hours off my time. I missed it by this much if I just train harder. And then all of a sudden my father passed away. And I had this really intelligent conversation with his uh, neurologist. And all of a sudden new pieces of the puzzle started to fit in together. And, and the thing about resilience is it's a moving target. So is your vision in life. You have to be a lifelong learner. You have to be open to being curious. 
And this is where Sarah felt that this really fit in was it helps people connect the dots between being personally healthy and happy and resilient and professionally healthy and happy and resilient. And how can those two worlds come together? It's that big picture thinking. It's that feeling like you were making progress on both fronts that keeps that employee engaged. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, does anybody else have any questions that they want to ask? Jacqueline, you're free to ask more if you want have more questions. No, I'm just I'm going to probably, probably do the course. Okay. So listen, um, what I will do, I'm going to, first of all, thank everybody for your time today. This has been awesome. Uh, I'm really glad that I had the three of you show up uh, for this uh, presentation. I will be reposting this presentation on my YouTube channel, and I'll share a link with you to it if you want to share that with somebody else. Um, and I will share with you uh, your, if you leave me your email address in the chat, I will share with you um, the PDF of the full presentation so that you can then take it back and share that with anybody you wish. Sound fair? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and I truly appreciate you spending your, uh, your time with me today. All right. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Steve. Bye Tara. Bye Christina. Bye Jacqueline. Bye. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bye. Thank you. And Tara, this will be on the rebroadcast if you want to catch it from the beginning again. Yeah, I apologize for the no, that's okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm just glad you stuck around for the end. And uh, yeah. yeah, again, this uh, uh, the whole thing will be rebroadcast, so I'll send you a link to that if you leave your email in the uh, chat. All right? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Awesome. Thank you, Tara. Have a great right. day. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye for now.